Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Lisa Blackburn. This is my YouTube channel for everything I want to talk about science and math. And today we're in chemistry class, finishing the unit four notes on bonding, hopefully finishing. And uh, also talking about writing and um, reading and making uh, names for compounds. So where we got to last time is we had seen how we could use the Lewis structure to see how ionic compounds form. Do ionic compounds transfer or share electrons? Ionic. Transfer. Covalent, remember, are our divorced parents who have the custody arrangements, and they share. Ionic, they're the ones who give up their electrons or take electrons. So, we, so we're doing ionic first. They're easiest. And we start with sodium chloride. Sodium is in the first family, so it has one electron it wants to get rid of. And so it gives it to chlorine, because chlorine is in the halogen family, the one that wants to get one electron. So it pushes it over, and then opposites attract, and also the math has to work out. And one minus one is zero. The answer to all of our problems needs to be zero this time. That's easy, right? Easy math. So then this one was a little bit more complicated. With, we did the Lewis structure for calcium and fluoride, and calcium has two electrons, and fluorine has seven. So set the, fluorine wants one more to have that octet to have eight, and calcium wants to get rid of both of those. Well, fluorine will only take one. Fluorine doesn't want nine. That wouldn't make fluorine happy. Fluorine wants to have eight. So uh, there has to be another fluorine. Calcium will give one electron to this fluorine and one to the other one. Calcium will get rid of both electrons, have a plus two charge, and each of the fluorines will have a negative two charge. So we ended up with one calcium and two fluorines. One calcium and two fluorines. How do we feel about that? Is that good? Okay, now, this is, see how it says crisscross applesauce? Okay, you don't have to go through all of this to get the answer. You don't have to start and draw your Lewis structures and figure out how many you need and all that. All you have to do is most of the time, you, there's a shortcut, and this is the symbol for it, crisscross applesauce. Okay, so if you're looking at me and you're doing it wrong, I go, ka -ching. That means you're supposed to crisscross applesauce. And that means you take whatever, when you write down the charges on the ions, you write them as exponents. You learn that in our computer FET interactive thing we did. You learn that where the charge goes is where the exponent goes in math. Right? You remember that? Okay. So those exponents have charges on them. When you write the formula, they're no longer superscripts exponents, they become subscripts, and they switch. So see, calcium had a charge of plus two. You take the charge off, there's no charge anymore. That plus two goes down here uh, as a subscript from fluorine. Fluorine had a, a superscript, an exponent, a negative one. The, you, there's no charge on it. You leave off the positive and negative, and the one goes down here for calcium. But remember, we don't write ones. We're too cool for that. They're just understood. Okay, how do we feel about all that? All right? Okay, so what I want you to do in your notes, the fourth or fifth page you got was a worksheet that said reading and writing chemical formulas. So I'm going to try to just put that down. It looks like this. Chapter worksheet, reading and writing chemical formulas. So we're going to try to do some of these. Okay? We're going to do them together. We're going to do a few of them. You're not, you don't know how to do this whole worksheet yet. We're going to just do some of them. And then as we learn, we will keep doing it. And eventually, you'll be able to do the whole worksheet front and back. And you'll be great at this. And you'll, it'll be awesome. Okay? But we're going to start on this side where it says... Uh, well, if you weren't here, you need to look. Don't look there. If you weren't here the day we did this, look in your drawer where it says makeup work. There should be pages for you with your name on it. The, the extra work, the extra copies are for people who lost theirs. <laughs> they lost theirs and they need another one. But if you weren't here, always look in makeup work. Okay. 
So how do we do these? So you're gonna need your periodic table. I would get out that periodic table that your cheat sheet periodic table that you write on. So everybody get that out. Because that's what you that's your tool you're gonna use to be able to do this. Okay? So you have written across the top. Let me write on mine. I'm gonna write with another color. I'm gonna write with green. Sorry, I got the blue on there. All right, so I write on mine. One, two, three, S. S is for skip. Negative three, negative two, negative one. I put zero for zip. Okay, so that's going to tell me. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the chemicals. So sodium is right over here. It's in the first column. And we're going to write above sodium. Okay, right above sodium, we're going to write its symbol. Na, and we're going to write its charge. So what charge will sodium make when it's an ion? What does it say at the top of its column? What? One. one. Plus one or minus one? Plus one. But we don't write the one, we just write a plus, right? Because we're cool. Okay, so now fluorine. What symbol? What is the symbol for? Well, okay, so I didn't tell you about the eye part. Okay, you've heard of this before. You've, been, you've looked at your toothpaste before and said that it had, saw that it had tin fluoride or sodium fluoride. You've, read, you, you've heard of chlorine and then chloride. Okay, so when the name for ionic compounds, remember that the cations go first, the anions go second. When you write the name the, for the cation, you just write it down. So the name for sodium is sodium. That's easy. But for the anion, for the ending of the, you change the ending of the anion. So, and you change it to IDE. So even this, uh, this doesn't say fluorine, it says fluoride. That ide is just telling you that it, it became an ion and now it's in a compound. And it is the anion. Are we okay with that? So that's just a little signal to you that it's in a compound. It's not elemental. It's not molecular. It's not just by itself. It's in a compound. And it's just the second word for these that ends like that. Okay, so this is fluorine. Even though it says fluoride, this is fluorine. What's the symbol for fluorine? F. So we write an F right here. And what charge does fluorine have when it becomes an ion? Negative one. Okay, so now we check our math. Is one minus one zero? Yes. Yes. So if it makes zero, whether or not they're ones or something else, if it just makes zero without having to have extra copies of it, you just write them together. So our formula is NAF. More fun with sound effects. Okay, how are we doing with that? That, that? that one was good, right? Do you remember learning this one in physical science? In eighth grade? Okay, so let's try calcium chloride. What is the symbol for calcium? What is the charge for calcium? Plus two. What's the symbol for chloride? It's not, chlor it's not really chloride, it's chlorine. So what's the symbol for chlorine? CL, and what's the charge for, for chlorine? Minus one. minus one. Is two minus one zero? No. no. So what do we do? Ka-ching! Crisscross applesauce. So that means the two is going to go down here and the one down there. So it's CA2, I mean, CA1, uh, 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 CL2. How do we feel about that one? Crisscross applesauce. Okay, potassium sulfide. Try it by yourself. Everybody try potassium sulfide by yourself. See if you can do it.
Did you get it? Potassium is plus one. Sulfur is minus two. Crisscross applesauce, K2S. Potassium sulfide. Anybody not get it? You need me to explain it one more time. I don't mind. I know this is like brand new weird chemistry stuff. Sometimes hard to get the first time you hear it. Okay, try the next one by yourself. Try aluminum oxide by yourself. When I le learned chemistry, my first professor was British. So I will actually say some things British because that's how I learned them. I didn't know you said it a different one, but it was aluminum. But I knew to aluminum. I, I knew about aluminum foil. But we went to the laboratory and we had aluminum. Dr. Thomas, great man. Okay, aluminum. Did you get it? This is easy, right? Don't you feel smart doing this? Oh, I'm just writing formulas for aluminum oxide. Okay, now the next one you don't know how to do. What is this? Okay, so copper to bromide. Um, copper is in the middle there, those, those hippie elements. They don't become ions when they do metallic bonds. What they do then, like if copper is being mixed with zinc to make brass or something like, or like that, then, um, then they don't really form bonds. That's when the electrons just run around wherever they want to free and wild. And that's called a metallic bond, okay? But they can become an ion and they can become an ionic compound. Just like how the hippies in the Manson cult eventually just settled down and got married and had kids and lived normal lives. The ones who didn't go to jail. <laughs> there were other people who didn't commit murder that day. The people who committed murder, they're in jail or dead. But the ones who didn't, the ones who stayed home that day, they left the cult, they left the compound, and they just settled down. Okay, So these are our hippies who have decided to settle down and leave the cult. Now then, the thing is, is because of those just really loose electrons they have, they can form more than one ion. And it'll make bad TV if I go and show you, but y'all can just look. Do you see the periodic table that I have hanging back there um, by the hood? See that one? The reason why that periodic table is there is it's got these little red X's on the elements and in the X's, they tell you numbers that, will, that are the different ions that the element can make, okay? So in particular, the, the ancient metals, the ones that have been around forever, can make more than one compound. So looking your notes, I gave you a list of the ones that can make more than one compound. Is it on the back of the last? It's, it's right there. Tur turn your paper over, okay? Hold that up so everybody can see. That's what you're looking for, everybody. There is actually on your notes in more than one place. It's also at the bottom real little underneath the polyatomic ion sheet. Okay. So everybody found that? Let's see if I got my copy. I bet I don't. Everything's more fun with sound effects. Let's see if I got it here. It might be right here. That's that page. That's that page. Okay, it's right here. I wish I had the other one. I'd show it to you. Okay, so on this page also, it's got this listed. It's down here in this little box. And if you look in this little box, or on the back of that sheet, you see that copper can be copper one or copper two. Now that's the new, the 
new way to do it. In the 80s, when I was in, when I was your age, and I was in chemistry class, I took Chem 1, and then it was like Chem 2 AP. That's what y'all are going to come back and take. So next year you do your physics and take either AP or honors, and then the next year you come back and we'll do uh, AP Chem. So those of you who love chemistry or, or those of you who just think you're going to do some sort of science major, you really might want to consider it because chemistry is often a weed out class to weed out science majors. Yes. So are AP classes rigor classes? Or yes, like all of them. All rigor. Of them. All okay. of them are rigor. All right. Every AP. All right. So anyway, um, so they taught me when I, back in the 80s, back in the dark ages of the 80s, that they were going to this new system of the Roman numerals, copper one and copper two. Did y'all learn Roman numerals when you were in elementary school? Oh, uh, I is one, two I's is two, three I's is three, I-V is four, that's where it gets tricky, V is five. That's about all you have to know for this. If you don't know those, I'll review it with you. Okay, so, uh, so copper can be either copper one or copper two. Copper one has a charge of plus one. Copper two has a charge of plus two. And they, but the old way to do it was they had Latin names. And copper one is cuprous, and copper two is cupric. Now, I was told in high school that that's the old way. It's gone. We're doing the new thing now. That was a big fat lie. <laughs> Absolutely a lie. Got to college, every, no, there was no copper one or copper two. Everything was cupric and cuprous. Everything was still the Latin names. And I was like, oh, rats. I didn't bother learning that because my teacher said that was gone and we didn't have to learn it. And other people knew it. And I had to go back and memorize these that, that like, cuprous is copper one and cupric was copper two. So now here, jump forward many, many years to the 2020s, and yes, you still see cuprous and cupric. It is the preferred thing. The, 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 see, they went from Latin to Roman numerals. Get the connection? But uh, the Roman numerals just have not caught on still after all these years. You have to know both. You're just going to have to know both because you're going to see both. When you go to college chemistry or if you are, you know, become a chemist or whatever, you're still going to see these all the time. Hate to break it to you, but you cannot do like I did and say, oh, I'm just not going to learn that. That's Latin. That's weird. I'm not going to learn that. Okay, so this is copper two. So what's its other name? Can you see it there? It's cupric. So it, you would also see cupric bromide, but it's easy if it's got the two because we know that it's copper plus two. Okay, now what about bromide? What is that one? What's bromide? Minus one. Minus one, and it's bromine, it's BR. So we crisscross applesauce, and it's C-U-B-R-2. Got it? Okay, the next hard thing. You knew it wasn't going to stay as easy as the first ones, right? Of course not. Silver. Silver is an ancient metal. It's right there in the middle. But if you look here, not on the list. Now, did I write, type it on yours? I typed that one that's on the back there. Okay, silver, ha and, and I want you to write this on your periodic table. There are a few of these metals that only have one ionic form, and you have to memorize it. So, but you can write it on your cheat sheet, because I figure you'll eventually learn it. Silver is plus one, everybody write that on there. Zinc is plus two, cadmium is plus two. So those three only have one ion they make. What? Yeah, silver is plus one, zinc, and cadmium are right here together in the same column, they're plus two. And that's the only ones they do. So it's the same as the oxidation state. Yes, we're going to be talking about that. <laughs> yes. Andres is figuring out stuff. He's getting ahead of us. All right. So knowing that, that silver is plus one, we can go ahead and write AG, 
and our plus. Chloride is Cl and it's minus. What do I do for this? I just write them together, right? AgCl, silver chloride. Silver chloride, and we will use that in lab. It's a fun chemical. It's expensive though, because it's got real silver in it. Okay. Let me scroll this up and see if we're ready to move on, if there's anything else I need to show you. Okay, so see this one where it said iron three? That's off of that. That's ancient metal. Lead two. Stannous fluoride. Is stannous on the periodic table? No. Well, you, you learned it for your naming test. What is stannous? It's the ancient name of what? Remember, you had to learn those for matching for that for your names and symbols test. What's Stannis? Iron. Nope. Iron. Iron is uh, oh, ferric. I read the wrong one. It's ten. It's ten, right? Stannis fluoride. That that's ten, and that's what's in toothpaste usually now. So uh, so when you see something like that, Stannis, ferrous, cupric. And you know, hey, that's not on the periodic table. Go look at your list of ancient metals. It's going to be one of those. And you're going to re start remembering those from what your last test. Okay, you got that? Okay, so y'all should be able, oops, y'all should be able to do all of that. Let me scroll. Uh, potassium sign. Okay, so now go down to this one. Magnesium hydroxide. We're going to roll down. I don't want to do them all for you. You got to practice it yourself. It's one level of skill for um, me to do it, another one for you. Okay, so what about hydroxide? Is hydroxide on the periodic table? Did you learn that when you learned your elements? No. no. So, it, so, but it is an anion, or you could look in your ancient metals. Nope, not there. Okay, look at this sheet polyatomic ions. So what is a polyatomic ion? And I do this different than Miss Dutton, who used to teach the honors and AP chems and stuff. What she used to do is she would, she would give you a test on this and make you memorize it. I don't make you start learning it until you know what it is. I feel like it's hard to memorize when you don't understand something. It's better to have understanding. So, uh, I, so eventually I expect you to know some of these. I don't know if I'll test you on them like how she did though. I, I'm still, I feel like you just end up learning them by using them. Learn it a little bit more organically. Okay, so now, if it's something like that, then let's look on this sheet. Can anybody find hydroxide in the polyatomic ions? Yes, where is it? Um, it's under the one minus. It's under one minus. It's OH. Negative, okay? So let's write this one down. So we know magnesium is Mg. What's the charge of magnesium according to our periodic table there? Plus two, so we could go ahead and do that. And then hydroxide is OH minus one. It's a capital O and a capital H. So what is that? What do we have going on here? We have two things. I heard somebody say it, two. We have an oxygen and a hydrogen. Now, oxygen and hydrogen, notice, they're both sort of non-metals, even though hydrogen's over there. But um, but they are are sharing electrons. They're like our divorced parents. They have a covalent bond. the The hydrogen is sharing a pair of electrons with oxygen. But then together, they are acting like one atom that has gained an electron. They have a charge there of minus one. So this is what polyatomic ions are. Poly means many. Polyatomic, many atoms joined together but acting as one. A polyatomic ion. They act together as one and they have a charge. And you find their charge under up at the top. So ammonium has a plus one. And it's a nitrogen bound to four hydrogens. All of these are minus one. Over here we have minus two, minus three, minus four. 
So this is polyatomic ions. If you look on the back, is your back like this? You have this, right? Yeah. Okay, here's another list of polyatomic ions. It's, and I think this list is a little bit different. So if you can't find something on this list, y'all got young eyes, you can look at the little one right there. You might find some different ones there. There's all, so anyway, there, this is not an exhaustive list. There are more polyatomic ions out there. So if you can't find one, you can also Google it. <laughs> Google knows them all. All right, if you're stuck. Now on the test. On the test, I won't give you any that I haven't given to you. All right, any questions about that? Okay, so now how do we do this? Okay, so if we crisscrossed applesauce this, it would be M G O H. Two. Is that right? Can somebody say no? No, that's not right. Yes, you crisscross the charges. But if I just wrote that H2, that would mean I would have two H's and one O. I don't. I have two hydroxides. So how many O's do I have? Two. two. So how can I show that mathematically? It's one of our properties, yes? You said the two, like just a regular two from that OH. Another two, like right there? Mm -hmm. so like no, that would be magnesium if I put it there. Like oh, a big two? No, that's a good guess, but no. This is something you learned in math class. Yes. Yes, you do parentheses. Remember the distributive property? Anything outside the parentheses gets distributed to everything in the parentheses. Remember that? Distributive property. So this 2, remember parentheses means multiply in math. So this 2 goes for the oxygen and the hydrogen. Does that make sense? Everybody good? So this isn't going to be hard, is it? Cyanide. Is cyanide on the periodic table? No, it's a polyatomic ion. Uh, nitrate. Notice this is not nitride. If it was nitride, it would be nitrogen. But if it ends in eight, it's polyatomic. If it ends in ick, it's polyatomic. If it ends in ite, it is polyatomic. Ide, it means one atom. The other endings are going to give you a clue it's polyatomic. Okay, so let's do something. I think y'all know how to do all of that now. Let me, and we're going to practice this. We're going to play a little game with dice called Rolling Ionic. And, okay, so now this is, we did it the hard way. The hard way is, um, is where you have to go from the name to the symbol. The easy way is going from the symbol to the name. So, K-S. What is K? Potassium. potassium. So, we just write down potassium. And what is S? Is it potassium sulfur? Sulfide. So, you, take, you write down the beginning, and then you change the ending to I-D-E. Now, y'all are new at this. And, so, and usually, to me, how I change the ending is what sounds right. Y'all haven't been around long enough saying chemistry things to know what sounds right. So some of these, you might get the, end, the where do you begin the ending, what's considered the root, what is considered the, the ending. You might get a little wrong, but as you practice it, you'll start getting it right. And that's okay. Like, don't, don't be crazy about that. All right, so that's easy, isn't it? Very easy. Now then, let me look at, though, hold on a second. Let me find one to show you the backwards of. Not that, not that, not that. I should have gotten this out earlier. Maybe I got it over here. I got it over here. All right, let me show you this, though. You know about the parentheses now. Okay, let's find ones. Okay, let's go down to CUO. Okay, 
What is the name of CU? But which one? How are we going to know? Is it Kubrick or Cupris? Is it copper one or copper two? Let's figure it out. Okay, so how you know which one it is is you do it backwards. You going to tell us how to do it, Lori? Uh -oh. Well, since you did the plus plus thing, can you just put the two with the O and then the one and the Yes, okay. So you do it backwards. Before you can say the name, if it's one of these that have more than one oxidation state, you have to figure out the charges. So you go back and you say, okay, oxygen is minus two. And so, so they, if you, there are no subscripts here. So this one has to be also plus two. Does that make sense to you? Because it has to equal zero, two minus two is zero. And um, we know that they're, they're just written together, so that has to be two. So if you look back over there, which one is two? Look back over here. Is it cuprous or cupric? Which one's two? It's cupric. So this is cupric oxide or copper two oxide. So... Remember, it's Roman numerals, or it is, you could put in parentheses here, it's cupric. And I promise you, you're going to see cupric oxide more than you're going to see copper 2 oxide in real life. Very disappointing to me. I, I was ready to go with the Roman numerals. Okay, so now you should be able to do everything on the front and back of the sheet for Roman numeral one and two. When you get to Roman numeral three, stop. You don't know how to do those. Yeah, maybe by the end of the day you will. And you don't know how to do five either. Okay, and so there you got your Roman numerals one through five in case you don't know them. They're on this little sheet. That was smart of me to put those on there. Okay, are we all right with that? If you're not... Don't worry, test isn't until next Thursday. You've got time to learn it. Okay, so I am going to get rid of that. Okay, so now back to our notes. We did the worksheet. Okay, so now what you I just told you we're going to write in the notes. So in case you forget what I just said. So this is binary. What does bi mean? Two. So nary is name, binary. This says two names. It's the cation, cation, then the anion, then the ending. Whoops, got to make it right again. Let's roll up first. Hold this. Since it's not doing it right anyway, let's just roll it up. All right. Now we'll go back to draw. Okay, plus the ending IDE. For example, ARBR3. What's that? What's the name of ALBR3? Alumi aluminum or aluminum. And what's his last name? Bromide. Very good. Aluminum bromide. NaCl? What's Na? Sodium. Cl? Chloride. Chlorine becomes chloride. And where do you find sodium chloride in real life? Salt. Table salt. I think we have it drawn right there. Whoop. Okay, polyatomic. The names uh, are, on a, are on a chart, is where you find them. Uh, and they're also, they're on a periodic table I haven't given you, I don't say. Oh, look on the back. Look on the back of the periodic table I gave you. I think there are some there. Are there some there? Some polyatomic ions on the back? Yeah. Yay. Okay, good. So some of them are there. Okay, also, the other thing, you'll, it says you'll have a quiz on these. Maybe. I haven't decided yet. 
I, I, I used to not do that. I came here, they did it. I started doing it. I don't know if I'm sold on that quiz or not. Okay, ancient metals. Some metals uh, are ancient, and they have more than one ion they can make. So, um, in that case, the cation is followed by a Roman numeral. See my little Roman dude over there? Telling the charge. Or... The cation has a different name based on its Latin name. And y'all learned the Latin names already. For example, ferric. You look on your chart and you tell me the answer. Is iron what? Look on your chart and tell me what ferric is. I'll take a dance break while you look it up. <laughs> what is it? Iron what? Three. 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 That's right. So it is iron three. Okay, so it's Fe plus 3. And ferrous is iron what? It is iron 2. Fe plus 2. Okay, when ionic compounds form, they arrange in crystal lattices. They arrange in crystals. Now, that's the other reason why I have that periodic table back there. Lynn? Look at that periodic table for us. Do you see how there's little geometric shapes on the squares? Do you see how there's some little geometric shapes sort of drawn on there? That's the crystal lattices. They're telling how these elements like to form crystal lattices. If you become a chem major, you'll get to study this more. But, um, and, and normally I do have honors learn a little bit more about it than regular. And, and But I don't know. I'm trying to really hurry and get us through Unit 6 before spring break. I want to do 4, 5, and 6 before spring break. So we might not spend too much time on that, or we might. We might do a little um, building some crystals. That's always fun. When it's a crystal lattice, one list, so like if you have salt, sodium chloride, it goes sodium chloride, sodium chloride, sodium chloride. And then on the top, if this is sodium, it goes chloride, sodium, chloride, sodium, chloride, sodium, repeating over and over again. It's not just really one sodium stuck to one chloride. It's built in this whole big crystal. But one repeating unit is called a unit cell. A unit cell. Unit cell. Okay. And it gives them um, the characteristics that we'll learn in the lab. And we're going to go over this after the lab. So, um, make sure you make a little note to yourself that you make sure you either write it in your notes or study your lab. Because on the test, there will be questions about what are characteristics of ionic compounds and what are characteristics of covalent compounds. It's a lab where you discover this, so I don't want to tell you. You're going to have to discover it for yourself, but don't forget to study on the test because I'm going to have a whole list of characteristics, and A will be ionic, B will be covalent, or if you have the other test, B will be, A, A will be covalent, B will be ionic, and it will list all these characteristics and you tell which goes with which. It's going to be about 20 questions on the test, so don't forget to study it. All right, I'm going to scroll up. We're doing really good. Y'all are doing great. I feel like you're learning this well. Okay. So, there are these, so I always try to add a little practical things, and one practical thing is that, um, and yours is different here, is there are these things called salt domes. In the earth, there are places where salts have made bubbles in the earth, and they're extremely stable. Uh, so these, these ionic compounds are extremely stable, and, they, and they're either hollow or can be hollowed out. Have you ever seen a geode? You ever cracked a geode and seen the crystals inside? You can think of it like that. So there's a bunch of these in the earth, and they had an idea that they were going to use them to store radioactive waste. One of the problems with nuclear power, like 
They try to say it's a green energy source because it doesn't leave a carbon footprint. Well, you know, it kind of leaves a radioactive footprint, which it seems a little worse to me because it will give you cancer and cook you like a hot dog in the microwave oven. So, but they, so once you've used nuclear fuel, you can't just throw it in the trash can and throw it away because it's going to continue for millions of years, possibly, giving off radiation, causing cancer, birth defects, and death okay so and of course nobody wants it stored in their backyard no one wants it stored in their community so then they said oh we have an idea we'll stick it in the salt domes and they're really stable and that's where we can put them they're not stable enough for nuclear waste nowhere no, nowhere is and you know um you're going to have to decide as a voter whether you're for nuclear power or against it I'm against it because of uh, because of Chernobyl, because of what happened in Japan. I think it's too unpredictable, and because of nuclear waste. I'm like, we just got to do something else. That's that's just too dangerous. For I think now I had a nuclear scientist come speak at my um, old school, and of course he was all for it. He thought it was great, the, a great energy source. So you know, different scientists have different opinions about this. I am, I'm no nukes, <laughs> no nuclear salt. So what, so anyway, they decided uh, that doesn't work, putting radiation in it instead. And what they do now is they put oil in it. They, so there, there are these things under the Gulf of Mexico, and they will store oil in them, in what's called the oil reserves. Our country will buy extra oil, so in time of crisis, we've got some oil. So, like, if the oil price, go, if the gas price goes way up, a lot of times the president will release the oil reserves and make the price go down some. Um, under Trump, under President Trump, the economy was terrific and oil was very cheap. So we were an oil exporting country. We were selling oil. And, um, and so President Trump bought lots and lots of oil and put them in these oil reserves for a hard time. Well, now under Biden right now, it's the hard time. Uh, you know, we've got the, the war going on, and so there's a lot of call. Uh, so uh, y'all might not, you might not be driving yet. You might not have noticed the gas is near $5 a gallon, but it's the hard times. And so there were, so, so you'll hear on the news about them releasing the oil reserves, uh, this gas that was bought for so cheap and stored under President Trump. And um, this is what they're talking about. It goes right with our chemistry lesson. That oil is in these salt domes. Yes? Gas went up 24 cents in a day. It's, I was so shocked. I filled up my car yesterday, and it was $99. Yeah. I have never paid $99 for a tank of gas in my life. It was 345 and now it's 379 or at least it was last night. I don't know if it went up again. It is crazy. So, anyway. That's where it is. It's in these these domes. So I got rid of the, I had put the, the radiation symbol on here in the notes, but I got rid of it. And I put a little oil barrel instead because I didn't want you to be confused. They thought about putting radiation in it. That won't work. They put oil in it instead. So anyway, yeah. And it, yeah, it's crazy. And now there's more to say about that, about all of that oil and what's going on in other oil. But we'll get back to this. Okay. Covalent bonds. Um, covalent is with our divorced parents, and this is where they are sharing. This is where they're sharing the electrons, and it is between two non-metals. The ionic is between a metal and a non-metal. Covalent is between two non-metals. So, like, one of the things on the test, I'll have a bunch of things that will be ionic or covalent. And you will say, and you'll see a compound... And you'll see those between two non-metals, and you'll go, oh, that one's covalent. Okay, so what they do, they don't just share one electron. They share an electron pair. It's always two electrons that they share, and that's what makes a bond. So, for example, uh, methane. So, we talked about carbon's real Lewis structure is that... And we talked about the, it's really uh, carbon, let's put a little six here. It's 1s2, 2s1, 2p3. 
Do you remember why carbon does that? I told you yesterday. It's because it is happier with two half filled instead of one of two filled and one weird not half, just partially weirdly filled. To, uh, one third filled. It doesn't like that fraction. It likes a half better than a third. So what it really does is this, and it has four bond places. Now hydrogen, I'm going to change colors. The Lewis structure for hydrogen is it has uh, one electron. If it hasn't lost it, it's got one electron, and that's its Lewis structure, right? So whenever it's just got one dot, it will get together with another chemical because it wants a pair there. It wants a, a, it wants a bond. That is unstable to it, to have just one hanging out there electron. In fact, hanging out electrons can be free radicals, which can cause you cancer in your body. You don't want free radicals. You don't want just hanging out electrons and things like that. You want everything all bound up and nice. Okay, I'm going to change back to carbon. So this is what it does. Carbon's got its four places with just one dot. Wherever there's just one dot, it's ready to make a bond. So it gets together with hydrogen. Is one hydrogen going to be enough? Is that happy now with this one hydrogen? No, it's still got three dots. So instead, it's going to go find some more hydrogens. And they are going to bond with this carbon. These are all shared pairs. And that is methane. Where do you find methane? Gas. The natural gas in our, in our room here is methane. Also, if you, you have gas, uh, that's methane. <laughs> this is, and yes, they, if you light them, they will burn, but you can get very burnt in a very private place, so don't do it. There you go. That's, that's your safety right there. Don't light it. Okay, so this is the structure it shows you for methane there. Now, they usually do not um, share, what am I doing here? Uh, they usually don't share the electron equally. And we talked about that, just like the divorced parents. They only bond exactly equal when they are bonding to an identical atom then they will share exactly equally because they have the same electronegativity. And you'll notice in our standard, we, we have talked about all of this now. Yay! Oh my, maybe a little bit more on G. So example of a diatomic mo molecule, what does di mean? Di means at what number? Two. So diatomic is where they are bound to themselves. And ones that do this is hydrogen, gas, so it's H2. Uh, nitrogen, I'm going to just list them without commas, because I think nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so you have to memorize these. These are the mighty diatomics. These will bond to themselves and be a gas. And get how many of them are there? Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they make a seven on the periodic table. Where's my periodic table done? Periodic table, here it is. So look, you go hydrogen, and then you go over here and start with nitrogen, and it makes a seven right there. Do you see it? So hydrogen, and you can sort of, it'd be a weird looking seven, but you can even include that one. But hydrogen and then seven. Those are the, these are the gases. So like right now, about 20% of the air in this room is this molecule, O2. The other, about the other 80% is this molecule, N2. Your air is basically nitrogen and oxygen. Now is that all? Of course not. There's all the other gases like carbon dioxide in here too, but, but mostly it's those. Okay, next idea. Any questions about that idea? You've got to memorize the seven diatomics. There's also ones like when carbon bonds to itself. Um, these double dots can be written as lines. And we're going to do a lab with this. 
You've seen that before, haven't you? Uh, chemistry things with the bonds drawn as lines. I used to have a t-shirt that was caffeine, the molecule caffeine. Actually, I still have one, but, but anyway, it has it as lines. Okay, so as long as it's the same molecule sharing, it will be uh, equally shared. Okay. Now, in general, though, what usually happens, I'm going to change colors because I need some more room here. We'll write in dot, dot, dark blue. The more electronegative, gets the electron more. Whichever one is more electronegative, whichever one has the ability to hold electrons to itself better, gets the electron more, okay? Um, this causes the atom to have a little bit, even though it's a neutral atom now, it will have a little bit of a positive and negative end. It's not an ion anymore, it's an atom. It's, it's considered electrically neutral, but it'll just have an end to it that's a little more positive and an end to it that's a little more negative. So it's called polar, because it has ends. Our Earth has poles, doesn't it? Where the polar ice caps are. So our Earth has ends when a molecule is not the same all when a, not, yeah, a, a compound is not the same all over a molecule, then it is said to have ends like that and is said to be polar, like the Earth. All right, I'm going to scroll this up. Get our time. We're doing fine. Okay. So uh, the the positive and negative parts are called dipole moments. It sounds like they're, you know, poured out their glass of wine and they're having a moment. Dipole moment. It's just a weird name to me. Dipole moments. I don't drink alcohol, so for me it'd be a cup of coffee and maybe some chocolate. Uh, there's too much alcoholism in my family. My family people are uh, teetotalers, which means you never drink, or alcoholics. We don't have to do alcohol in my family. It's all or none. And since I don't want to be at the AA meeting showing everybody my chip, then I'm going to just not drink at all. I, I promise you it's true. Family reunions, people are sitting there taking out their chip, showing it to each other. <laughs> we don't do alcohol in my family in moderation. We're all or none. So I think I'll be none. Okay, dipole moments. Uh, where am I here? We already talked about all that, all of that. I want to make sure. Okay, so the symbols. So this symbol for this partial positive and partial negative is weird. Let's see if I'm on here. Yeah, I am. It's like this sort of almost unclosed eight, and then you put a charge. So that would be a partial positive charge, and this is a partial negative charge. Sometimes they're written a little different. It's a Greek letter. It's, a, it's like a, a lowercase delta. So lowercase d, uppercase delta is the triangle. This is the lowercase one, and it gets a little charge on there. So an example is water. I always say that uh, water is unimpressed Mickey Mouse. <laughs> but my students always say, no, it's Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Whichever one you want. I say it's Mickey Mouse, and he's unimpressed. Okay, oxygen is the big molecule. Oxygen is bigger than hydrogen. Water is H2O. The oxygen is more electronegative, so it keeps the electrons more, giving it a partial negative charge. The, the hydrogens don't get the electrons as much, so they end up with a partial positive charge. It is a polar molecule. <coughs> We're going to talk more about that at the end of the year. Any questions about that? Does that make sense to you? Like you get to learn Greek, makes you feel important. Whether a bond is considered covalent or ionic is based on a numerical value. A numerical rating, it's a scale. So it's not so cut and dry that this electron is transferred and this one is shared because oxygen is such a bully, it almost steals hydrogen's electrons but not quite. So how do you make the decision? Was this one ionic or covalent? It's based on a number, and I can show you that scale, and I can show you how to look it up. 
but mostly, but water is covalent. It is considered sharing, not, not on that. Okay, so bond angles. There is based on Vesper theory. Vesper theory, uh, <laughs> on our standard, which is standard two, and this, this unit sort of crosses standard one, two. It, tell, it says on the standard that you are not to learn Vesper theory. So, shh, everybody be quiet about this because I'm going to teach it to you. To me, it's so much easier to learn something if you know why. And don't just try to, I am no good at memorizing in a vacuum. I have to, to understand why to be able to memorize. I was that terrible kid in third grade who could not learn their multiplication tables because you were told to memorize it with nothing to add to it. I didn't memorize my multiplication tables until I started using it in multiplication, and then I could learn it. But just to learn it as, as tables, I don't think I ever made 100 on that multiplication tables time test. You know where you got a page and you have to do them as fast as you can? That was, I just couldn't do it. I'm very good at them now, but at that time, no, I could not learn in a vacuum. So I am going to teach you why with these things, and it won't hurt you one bit to learn why. Okay, so are we going to do this like this? No, we're going to say this. Okay, so there's a thing called lone pairs, unshared pairs, okay? Um, then we'll do our thing. Unshared pairs. Okay, so let me show you what that is. So if we did the Lewis structure for nitrogen, how many, elect how many dots does nitrogen get in its Lewis structure? How many? Somebody said it, say it louder. Five. Do you see how it's five over from the left? One, two, three, four, five. Everybody see that? So we put a dot on each side. Let's change colors. It'll be pretty. Uh, we put a dot on each side. You put one on each side until everyone has, has one, and then you double up. That's how you, why you go up, 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 down, down, down. It's that, okay? So right here, my nitrogen is single and ready to mingle with three dots here, ready to make a connection and make a bond. But here, there's two dots. Those two dots, it's fine. It doesn't want to do any bonding there. This is the unshared pair. They're a huge concentration of negative. Sometimes it's drawn like that. Sometimes they'll draw a little bubble on it, which I think makes it look like some sort of weird alien. So if it looks like a little alien there, that's also an unshared pair. And just remember it's negative. It's made out of electrons and no bond is going to happen there. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is we got to do this very fast and I'll pro uh, I'm going to keep this going. Um, I need some of y'all very quickly to grab paper towels. Everybody needs a paper towel. So get up, grab yourself a paper towel, grab one for your seatmate, and I'm going to come around and give you some lab equipment. Do not eat your lab equipment until I tell you to do so. If you cannot eat this for any reason, don't do it. Eating your lab equipment is not required. I had somebody get really mad at me because uh, marshmallows were against their religion. And if the marshmallows are against your religion, do not eat them. Do not violate your religion for the sake of eating your lab equipment. Some religions don't eat marshmallows. Some vegans don't eat marshmallows. Yes, the marshmallows have gelatin in them. And gelatin could be made from animal, it's a, it could be an animal by, byproduct. And unless it says it's kosher or halil, then it could be made from a pig. And Jews and Muslims don't eat pig. Okay. So, <laughs> there you go. That's why some do not eat. All right, so I bring this around. Uh, actually, y'all could do this. Just don't spill them. Take one marshmallow, I need one. Take a marshmallow and pass it. Everybody gets one big marshmallow. And you get some preference. That's the one of my favorites. I'm not good at Orbeez. Uh, where's your paper? Yeah. 
You want to know what I like? I really like rice. I love rice. Like, I love rice. Yeah, I like rice. With butter, it's just butter. Yeah, I mean, I have rice. It's best to stop that kind of meal that you eat and like there's nothing in the refrigerator. But it's so good. Yeah, whenever my friends tell me, first thing I see my mom has a rice gallon and no rice. So you like basil? Okay, I thought that was good, but like it's really good. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't really question it. She's so Dominican. So I was just like, oh, my God. One of my best friends was that. I was like, for the It was good. Rice with bacon is good. You don't like rice? Yeah. Nobody can have it. Yeah, just a second. You'll be able to. But yeah. And I like it. Yeah, I don't know. Do I have to eat the pretzels? You don't have to eat anything. You never have to eat anywhere in lab. No, I'm not. That's always just an option. It's not always an option. Who ready about that? Pretzels are disgusting. Wait, I love pretzels. The mom says Eli totally agrees with you. I love pretzels. He does not like pretzels at all. They taste like... Yeah, they taste like... They don't want chips like for what it's not. Those are the best snacks. Those are the best snacks. Wait, how many of you guys have this? Look at this. I know. It's like skinny sticks of salt. Yeah, it's just terrific. There's something wrong with you and my son, Eli. And, okay, this is why this is so delicious, is the sweet and salty together. It's eating the pretzels with the pretzels. On the pretzels. But specifically, the very, the very thin pretzels. Do you like pretzels? Yeah, the sticks, they're in two categories. It's just so bread. All right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to learn Vesper theory. Don't tell anybody. All right, so this represents uh, an atom, okay? And this represents electrons. So our pretzels are negative. I want you, and remember, opposites attract, but what do likes do attract or repel? Repel. I want you to stick your pretzels in your marshmallow as far away from each other as you can. No, just two. Just two. Just two. Okay, and did you get something that looked like that? Mm -hmm. That's as far as you could get, okay? Let me see here. Okay, let me draw this first. If I did the Lewis structure for methane, it would look like this. You can also draw it, it's molecular formula. And that's where you write just what it is, CH4. It's structural formula. Wherever you have two dots, you draw a line. So you do C line, H line, H line, H line, H. So you're going to need to know the difference in Lewis structure, molecular formula, and structural formula. Okay, don't eat your lab equipment yet. You'll get to, but not yet. Okay, so we just made, with two bonds, it makes what is called a linear shape. Now, remember geometry, how many degrees is this bond angle? 180. 180. So linear is 180 degrees. Let's see how I do it. An example of it would be CO2, carbon dioxide, what you're breathing out right now. And if you were to draw it, it would have carbon in the middle, oxygens on each side, and it's actually a double bond where instead of having um, two electrons shared, they share four. 
So that's our example of it, okay? Now I want you to get a third pretzel and stick it in and make it as far away from the others as possible. Did you do it? Am I right? No, I'm leading you astray on purpose. This is wrong. They could get farther apart. Where should they be? What? Hold it up. If you got it, hold it up. You're not going to make, you're not going to participate in the activity. Hands on helps you learn. It helps you remember it. You can wash your hands at the end. We're going to deal with much more chemicals than marshmallow and pretzels. Anybody get it? Hold it up if you think you got it. This is wrong. Anybody get it? I'll hold it here. Sir. Anybody figured out the answer? No. Can you move these pretzels? You can move them. Oh, oh, yo, yo. Uh, close. Yes. It's the peace sign. Okay, so now, what is the bond angle for this? What's the bond angle? That one linear is 180 degrees. What's our bond angle here? No, not 60. 120. 120, yes, very good. This is called trigonal planar. It's 120 degrees. It's called tri, tri means three, trigonal planar. An example of this is SO3. Now, when you make these, the one, the, the, remember, nature likes balance. So it always tries to be as most symmetrical as possible. And if there's just one of something, it goes in the middle. There's just one sulfur, so that's what goes in the middle. And it's bonding to three oxygens. And we're not really going to talk about how. I guess I can show you what it does. It does this, and then it's got these extra unshared pairs. And... So and that's what it does. All right, so that's trigonal palatal. Okay, so now everybody try four. Everybody try four. Four pretzels. Try to put in four as far away from each other as possible. And I tell you, do you think I'm leading you astray again? No. Oh, you know it. This is wrong. This is wrong. No, she, what she did was like this. That's the same thing. You just turned this orientation in space. <laughs> Still wrong. Eh, thanks for playing. No consolation prize. <laughs> it's very important. I started to wear my learn, fail, repeat thing. It's very important to be good at being wrong in science. If you can't take being wrong, you don't need to be in science. Because in science, we're wrong all the time. We're wrong way more than we're right. My son Nathan is inventing some chemicals at Georgia Tech. He's had 80 fails before he's starting to get one or two that works of these chemicals. You gotta put it at the edge of the marshmallow. No, that's the same as this. <laughs> eh, wrong. Somebody start thinking outside the box. You don't put them on the marshmallow. That's what I did. What if you just like. Y'all are thinking 2D. There's your hint. We don't have time. It has to be in the marshmallow. Somebody figure it out and show it to me. Take out all but one and start over. Take out all but one and start over and think 3D. <laughs> but you're the only one who's touched it, so... Go, go like that. I think I think she's starting to get it. Somebody get it and, and hold it up high so I can see if it's right. No, Ian, you're still 2D. Still 2D. Still 2D. You got to start thinking 3D, like a 3D printer. Do you know we have one of those? If you join our STEM program, you get to play with it. Oh, I think Anthony has, uh, he's wrong, but he's getting, he's getting closer. <laughs> hold it up, Anthony, so that they can see it. For one, he's got way too many sticks in there. He's only supposed to have four. 
but notice sort of what he's doing with them. He's not keeping them in one plane. Will is wrong too, but you're closer. Hold it up, Will. Hold it up. You see how Will's not in one plane anymore? He's wrong, but he's getting closer. I think Divine has it. What you do is you take them, and it's like it's got a head and three little legs. But if you do it right, every way you turn it, it looks the same. Every way you turn it, it looks the same. Now this, you are indebted to. You, there would be no life on this planet if carbon didn't do this. This is the mighty tetrahedron. Its bond angle is 109.5. And yes, you have to memorize that. Our example is methane, CH4. And how methane does this is, it's, you know, methane is that. And we're going to be doing a lab where you're going to see a molecule of it where it's a little bit better. Okay, now, the other thing that you can have is this, but with an unshared pair. So everybody take another pretzel and stick it in the top of this. Do you see how now I've got my unshared pair up there? This unshared pair is more negative than these. These two pretzels is more negative than these one pretzels. That was bad grammar, but you get the idea, right? So you take your tetrahedron and you, and remember likes repel, and you squish down the bottom a little bit. Squish down the bottom. They want to scooch away from this unshared pair. When you talk about the shape of the molecule, you don't consider the unshared pair, and the molecule is considered to be just this, with it squished in a little bit, okay? And that is called the trigonal pyramid. Do you see how it looks like a little three-legged pyramid? Does that make sense to you? Okay, so the trigonal pyramid's bond angle is a little less than 109.5. It's 107, because they're squished down a little bit, and our example is ammonia, NH3, and, uh, and so how it would look is dot, dot, N, H, H, H. Trigonal pyramid. Don't you feel smart learning all these big new words? It's fun. Okay, let's get into it. All right. Let's see. Hold on. Okay, we got one more bit. Okay, so bit is what sulfur does. Uh, let me show you. It is it's it's pushed together by unshared pairs again. Was that greater than or less than? What's that symbol? Less than. So it's less than 120 degrees because it's being shoved. Our example is SO2. It looks like this. And see, it's sho this unshared pair is shoving this down. So take this and make your, try take out one, you can eat it. Make it your trigonal planar, but shove these in a little closer, like that, and that's this one. Okay, now you can eat your lab equipment if you want. <laughs> Ooh, that is a rough pretzel there. Okay, it's a little dry. You can tell that's Walmart brand. That is not rolled gold pretzel right there. All right, I already told you this. If they share one pair of electrons, it's a single bond. What do you think it's called if they share two pairs of electrons? Not single, but double. double. You're brilliant. And what do you think three pairs is called? Triple. Triple. Okay, now, if it is covalent, not ionic, we use prefixes. 
You've learned how to name ionic. What about covalent? You use prefixes based on Latin. So you're going to learn how to count in, in one way in chemistry for covalent names. Okay? So what do you think mono stands for? Di, tri, tetra. And how you can remember that is if you ever played that old game Tetris, you know, it's four little boxes that are coming towards you that you have to move around. I'm terrible at that game. I scream at it because they're falling too fast. I start going, ah! So I am really bad at Tetris, but maybe y'all are Tetris masters. Penta, what's Penta? Pentagram, Pentagon, five. So think about witchcraft. You can remember that one. Hexa, six. Hexagon. Now, this is the one nobody knows. This is unpopular. Hept. Anybody know Hept? Seven. Heptagon. Oct, everybody knows. Eight, because of the song. How many legs do an octopus got? Eight legs. Eight legs. Six legs? No, eight legs. Nine legs? No, eight legs. That's how many legs an octopus got. Did y'all learn that when we were little by Flippy the fish head? No? You know it's teaching counting, not grammar, because it's bad grammar. <laughs> Mr. Fishhead does not have good grammar. Okay, nine. What's nine? I'm going to say nine. Nine, you're right. And deca? Ten. Ten. Okay, so this is one of my little pet peeves. Deck, deaths. If an army is decimated, how many died? Ten. Not ten, but a... A tenth. 90% are ready to fight another day. People use this wrong word wrong all the time. If an army's decimated, all right. We did pretty good. We only lost a tenth of our troops. Yes, that's bad. But 90% are okay. So don't use that word wrong. Okay. Last little bit here. Um, let's do these examples, and we'll start with acid. We'll start with acids. Okay, so here's an example of how you do this. Okay, so um, here's an example, CO2. If there is only one and it is in the first name, you don't say it. It's an understood one. So we just say carbon. We don't say monocarbon. But there are two oxygens, so it's carbon what? You breathe it out. How many? How many? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Does that make sense? Yes. So you use the prefixes on the second one. But on the first one, you don't use the prefix if it's mono. Okay, how about the next one? What's its name? Carbon monoxide. Because the one is on the second one. And you already know those, and we're going to be practicing this. Carbon monoxide, and it will kill you. Okay, so covalent properties we're not going to do until we do the lab. You're going to come back and fill that in. We'll start on uh, Monday with acid names. For your homework, I would try to do some of that worksheet. I'll post the key on Canvas, but you need to try to do it before you forget it over the weekend. Try to do some of that worksheet, section one and two. And actually three you can do now too. All right, like, share, subscribe. Science is great.